Hi, this is Sean D'Souza, and you're listening to the Three Month Vacation Podcast. This podcast isn't some magic trick about how to work less. Instead, it's about how to really enjoy the work that you do and to enjoy your vacation time. Hi, it's Sean, and you're listening to the Three Month Vacation. Warm blueberries and ice cream. I'm not sure if you tried it, but it was one of the desserts that my wife Renuka would serve at parties. When we owned a microwave, she'd heat up the berries, and this was just a tiny bit, and she'd place it on top of the cold ice cream. Berries have this tart flavor, and they contrasted really well with the intense sweetness of the vanilla ice cream. But that was just at one level. But it's also warm and cool, so it creates a second level of contrast. And it creates this dessert that most guests loved. The opposite of contrast could be considered to be camouflage, couldn't it? And when we're in search for a title for a book, a report, a document, camouflage isn't exactly what we have in mind. So why not swing right to the other side and create contrast? This is episode two on what I learned from Malcolm Gladwell. And in the last episode, we looked at candy, how to put candy into your text. And we also learned how to gauge customer interest or reader interest. And in this episode, that reader interest is taken to another level with titles. We'll explore why some titles work better than others. And we'll also look at writer's block and is that a real thing, writer's block? Let's find out, but first let's start with titles. In 1965, American political activist Ralph Nader wrote a book, and this book accused car manufacturers of negligence. The book suggested that car manufacturers were not introducing safety features, features like seat belts, and they were not bothering to make the car safe. The book went on to be a bestseller in 1966. So what was the name of the book? It was called Unsafe at Any Speed. The magic of the book seems to pop out from the title itself, doesn't it? The suggestion is that car driving is dangerous 100% of the time. A title like this creates a deep sense of contrast. When you take a title and then you contrast it with something that is not supposed to be there, it creates intensity. That was Gladwell's first example. But he also talks about an article that he wrote, which is called The Art of Failure. And the moment you hear or read these titles, you are jolted back to reality. You want to find out more about it. You wonder what causes these titles to be so interesting, and it's contrast. When there is contrast, it doesn't matter if it's a book or an article or webinar, it gets our attention. Attention is cool, but it's not the only reason for the title. I will be talked out of my titles, says Malcolm Gladwell. I'm open to criticism at every level, but not about titles. The reason for the title is how it frames what is to follow. When you have a great title or a contrast-ridden title, it frames how the audience listens or reads your material. You have a huge advantage in capturing that client's attention. Gladwell obviously loves his contrast because his podcast is called Revisionist History, and that's a good example. History by its nature cannot be revised. That's a pretty heavy-duty title, but it still stops you in your tracks. Now you might think, well, Gladwell has star power and I don't. But with your title, you can create that star power. You can create that intensity. Because the moment you put in that contrast, it creates tension. Take, for instance, a book like Dartboard Pricing, which you can get on Psychotactics. Now, that has instant voltage. Pricing is supposed to be precise. It's supposed to have at least a feeling of science behind it. 
A dartboard for most of us seems to be a game that's slightly random. You drink a few beers, you go to the dartboard, you chuck the darts on the board and you hope everything sticks and you're laughing and it, it seems very disorganized. When I tell people that I've written a book on pricing, they ask the name of the book and I tell them dartboard pricing and you can see instantly there is a reaction because of the contrast. That contrast, it adds that tension to it and now you've got a name that's memorable, but it's also this nice little picture of a dartboard and pricing. Or if you take another example, like the book called The Brain Audit. The Brain Audit? What do you mean by The Brain Audit? How can you audit a brain? When you have titles that don't have this contrast, you don't create a hook, and therefore it's much harder to be memorable. However, you don't just need titles for a book or a report. When we started out Psychotactics, I met with colossal resistance. And the reason for all of this resistance was because I named it Psychotactics. Why would anyone name their company Psycho? It's crazy. It's something that doesn't seem to sit well. Now, I didn't know many people online, but the few I knew were not at all keen on me giving a name that seemed to suggest anything but marketing. I'm a bit of an iconoclast, so I went ahead with it anyway. And we noticed that a considerable number of subscribers, they clicked through on search engines. They were curious to know why anyone would use psycho tactics in their marketing. It's important to believe in your title, but at times it pays to just be mundane. The article writing course is a very ordinary title. You take the sales page course, the sales page workshop, very ordinary titles. However, they are descriptive, they do the job. And when you have multiple products, multiple courses, services, whatever, you don't have to have these fancy titles for everything. In fact, after a while, clients don't know what it stands for. You know, you have these conversations and you go, you know, in 5000 BC, oh, you know, in this thing. And they are like, what is he talking about? So sometimes having a title like article writing course is not just laziness. It's actually a positive thing. It's helping to be mundane to get that message across. Gladwell's advice is very sound. You want to come up with a title, you want it to be contrasty, you want it to create tension and voltage, and you want to defend it. But it does take a lot of practice to get good titles, or does it? Let's just do a little exercise here. Let's do some contrast, shall we? Let's look at some examples of books that are already out there. A book like Silent Spring. See that? There's contrast there. Spring is supposed to be loud, and that's what Gladwell explains. It's supposed to be loud, it's supposed to be noisy. What is Silent Spring? Well, that gets your attention. Everything happens for a reason. And then the subtitle is, In Other Lies I Used to Love. So there you go. What they're doing now is they're taking the title and the subtitle. So everything happens for a reason, that's what everyone says, and other lies I used to love. Straight away, there's contrast. There's another book called Thinking Fast and Slow. You can see the contrast there, can't you? Let's not stop there. Let's keep going for a couple more. Getting Slightly Famous. See? Got your attention. Some of us like the idea of being slightly famous, not very famous. And the last one, Strategic Goal Setting how to achieve at least 50% of your goals. Again, we have this title and subtitle. So strategic goal setting is pretty mundane, but how to achieve at least 50% of your goals. Aren't you supposed to achieve 100% of your goals? And this is the beauty of it. You can write the title. You don't have to worry if it's mundane or not. And then you go, where's the contrast? And you can do this in two ways. The first way is to just put in the word that you want, like spring, and then think of the connotations of spring, and then what is the opposite of that? And that creates contrast. The second way is to write out the word, maybe it's a word like college education, and then find something that completely contrasts with that. So there you've got a title and a subtitle. What you don't want is titles like we've given for some of our books that now is just too hard to change. Like one of our book series is called Black Belt Presentations. Now, Black Belt Presentations is a great series. It shows you how to do great presentations. But Black Belt Presentations, come on, it's, 
it's not memorable it has no contrast it has no tension it has nothing it's just a name just very boring and that's not the way you want to go about writing a title contrast is what matters in life Without that distinction, we have mostly camouflage. We have boring titles. We have just ice cream, plain old vanilla ice cream. What we need is some little blueberries on top, don't we? And that brings us to the end of the first part, which is how to name your book, how to name your course, how to name your webinar, and give it that little oomph. And this takes us to the second part, which is drafts and revisions in how they help avoid writer's block. Have you heard of the name Edmund Burglar? What should Edmund Burglar be famous for? If you ever get that question in a quiz, here's the answer. The answer is writer's block. That's because in 1950, Burglar wrote a paper called Does Writer's Block Exist? Burglar wasn't just shooting the wind. He had been studying writers for well over 20 years. And then he decided that writers didn't just drain themselves dry. They didn't run out of inspiration either. They were motivated. They were talented. They were just people who seemed unable to write anymore. So Burglar decides to unblock the writer, and he decides the best way to do this is through therapy. Yes, psychoanalysis is where you are going to be headed if you have the affliction of writer's block, according to Burglar. Luckily, we know a lot more about this so-called affliction today. And at least in some way, Burglar was right. It's a psychological problem. Gladwell talks about this topic in the chapter Drafts and Revisions. And here's what he says. Writers need to set realistic expectations. To avoid that menacing feeling of failure, we all need to set the bar a little lower. So what do we mean by setting the bar a little lower? Most writers put a measurement. They go, okay, I'm going to write a thousand words a day. This is a random benchmark. So maybe you write 1,000 words a day and then you write another thousand and then the third day you skip it in the fourth day. And now what's happening is you've got anxiety, you've got frustration. This is going to be a constant problem. The more pressure you put on yourself, the more likely you are to have serious barriers in your progress. It's essential for the writer to know how to tackle this whole writing process. The truth is that you can't write a lot in a day. It's demanding, creative work. It's physically and mentally strenuous. It wears you out, says Gladwell. And he's right. An idea isn't fully formed when you start writing. That idea morphs, it changes, it may even need to get discarded. And Gladwell gives a lot of writers hope because a lot of us think, wait, He's really good at this. He's been doing it for a long time. He's, well, probably turning them out page after page. And he says, I find myself mulling over something in my head. And I find myself mulling over it for 10 times the time that it takes me to write it. If I have a good page, I'm delighted. So this is where Gladwell is sitting. And it's essential for a writer to know how to tackle the writing process. If you were to look over the shoulders of people and you were to look at those who write a lot, you'll find that they are frustrated a lot. And this doesn't just apply to writing. When I'm drawing a cartoon, for instance, I'll head to the cafe, I'll head to the library. I have no idea what I'm about to create. All I have is this vague idea, this vague concept. So I'll take the pencil, I'll put it to the iPad and I'll start doodling. But at first, the ideas are pretty dull. Then one thought may cross my mind, or I may check Pinterest, and an idea will form into something entirely unexpected. Take for instance a drawing I did the other day, and it was about how to warm up your copywriting. So I did a cartoon that went with this article. Now I stared at the iPad. I was saying, come on, give me an idea. I looked at Pinterest. I had nothing. The usual heater, the sun, all those kinds of ideas came to mind. And then I saw a hot water bottle. 
And that set the chain of thoughts in progress. And I had an idea. I had an idea worth keeping. But this ideation process is only fun at the end. And it's totally inconsistent. It goes in any direction. You're thinking, 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 thinking. And then suddenly you're able to put it down on paper. And from there on, it's pretty quick. So maybe Gladwell is a pro at writing, but hey, I've been drawing cartoons for, I don't know, 35 years, maybe more. And you would think, hey, you can do this very quickly, but it's the same for everybody. I've heard Michael Lewis on a podcast and he says, you know, it's all of this setting up that's frustrating, all of this ideation that's frustrating. I've heard Alan Sorkin talking about writing scripts and he goes, Sometimes I go for weeks and months before I get anything together. So all of us, whether you're writing or creating a play or doing any kind of output, you're going to have to think about it. And then it goes down on paper. If you complete just three or four paragraphs a day, that's great, says Gladwell. But if you set yourself up to do a lot more than that, what you're doing is setting yourself up for disappointment. A few good paragraphs represent a substantial achievement. Often when I'm writing, I don't even bother to write at all. Instead, I just outline. I may choose to outline on a plain piece of paper, or on some days I'll go and use the iPad instead. And there are other sets of days when I will use the computer and mind map software. It's impossible to tell what software or hardware or anything you just go this is what i feel like today and the goal is just to clear my thoughts a single chapter will have one mind map then another then another by the end of the week i have six or seven mind maps and not a single word on the page and this is maddening because i know what is happening and I know this happens every single time, but of course, Renuka still gets the brunt of it because I'm getting frustrated. Nothing is getting down in this complete form. And what Gladwell does is he gives us some grace spirit. He says, choose to write a few paragraphs, then stop for lunch, then do something else like interviewing or anything. But just try to get through three or four paragraphs a day. My system is to get to the cafe, to look out blankly through the window at people passing by, create this mountain of mind maps over several days. And then when I'm ready to write, I've done most of my thinking, most of my refining. And then it's all go, go, go. Well, not all go, go, go. Because now we have to get to the drafts. We have to get to the revisions. I won't let anyone see my work while I'm creating it. And that's not because I'm insecure or shy but because the thoughts aren't clear and it would just confuse someone that's reading it. Once I'm done with that, I will get the entire chapter down or even a few chapters and then I send it out to David Green. David is one of the two people, two or three people, whom I trust to go through my work. Now, David is a client, he's not an editor, but he has a certain way of looking at a book that appeals to me. He improves my thought process. Teresa Rogovsky is another person who I rely on quite a lot. She tends to be very picky about stuff that I would normally gloss over. And then there's someone like Zach, and Zach will look for it from a stylistic point of view. And, you know, does this sit in with the stuff that we have to look for in grammar? So there are all these angles. Of course, there's always Renuka, and Renuka will go chop this off and kill that and... Um, that's what I end up with. I end up with three or four different people looking at it. And now we have these stages of revisions where the whole content is getting so much better. When you are just starting to write and you're not comfortable with that writing speed or the ability to write, you have to send it out to someone else. When I first started out Psychotactics, I had another client, Chris Ellington. Now, Chris would rip through my work and then I'd be looking at dozens of changes. I'd be tearing out my hair in frustration. I have to send out the newsletter today, but no. Chris comes back with all of these revisions at the last minute. Then I have to make the revisions. Then I have to put that newsletter out. 18 years have passed in a flash at Psychotactics. And now I'm in a better stage. 
but still there are going to be revisions it doesn't matter how much down the line you go because it just can be made better all the time and revisions as crazy as it seems you just have to deal with them even though it seems to impede your progress what's happening all the time is that your work is improving with enough time your ideas get sharper the concepts are explained better and your product becomes far more finished than if you just dashed it off in a hurry. All around us, we have business writers, we have writers, we have people conducting webinars, we have all of these so-called communicators who will gleefully tell you how they did something in super fast time. And usually their information feels like that. It feels shoddy. It's not carefully crafted. The stories lack pace. They lack restraint. The entire output seems like a meal of scrambled eggs and a real rush job. That's not as if to say you have forever to create a book or an article or any kind of communication. At Psychotactics, we tend to set a deadline. Our course notes are promised to clients by a fixed date, which is usually one month before the course begins. If I'm writing a book, I will pre-sell it always and give it a specific date. And to make it easy on myself, I will split a single book into three books. So if you look at a series like Black Belt Presentations, well, it's a series, but no, it was one book. It got split up into three books. And the same thing was for dartboard pricing. Could it be one long book? Of course, but the split gives the reader some breathing space. And if you happen to pre-sell it and then you reach the deadline and then the project is unfinished, you can still deliver one book and then the second book and then send the third book a week or two later. Drafts and revisions are very important. Drafts involve writing a little every day, thinking about what you're writing, and it's all part of the process. No matter whether you use Gladwell's system of writing, which is three or four paragraphs, or you don't write at all. You just create mind maps and another mind map and another mind map. It's the same thing. You're heading to a goal at this very glacial pace. You hurry it up and you put enormous pressure on yourself and then you head right into the realm of writer's block. But even if you make that mistake, you can always go back to the mind maps. You can reduce the pace. You can say, okay, I'm only gonna write three paragraphs and then you will find yourself moving yet again. And that will be the end of your writer's block and you won't need any psychoanalysis. Sounds good, doesn't it? And that brings us to the end of this podcast. This is the second in this series about what I learned from Gladwell. In the first episode, we covered candy versus the main meal. Then we covered how to gauge reader interest with conversation. But what did we cover today? The first was the power of juxtaposed title. So this is the contrast between the warm berries and the ice cream the tartness of the berries and the sweetness of the ice cream. But this works as well for books and titles and webinars and all of those things where you choose the word and then you have another word that contrasts it. Or you choose a title and then the subtitle contrasts it, like Silent Spring or Get Slightly Famous. And that was the first part in the episode. And the second part was about drafts and revisions and that you need to walk away from the draft. You need to walk away from it and you need to think about it and then come back. And this thinking process seems like such a waste of time, but almost every writer, every creator of anything needs this space. The space just to think, to clarify your thoughts. And as Gladwell says, sometimes it takes him 10 times as much to think about something than to write it. And some people take years to do this. Like, I've been thinking about the book on talent, which I want to finish by the end of this year. And I've been thinking about it for 10 years now. And it's only now getting to the point where I'm comfortable with it, which will enable me to put it down on paper. So you need to walk away from those drafts and don't wait for 10 years, but sometimes it happens. The same thing applies to revisions. Once you finish what seems like more or less complete stuff, someone's going to go through it. And what I tend to do is have two or three people that I trust. They don't have to be editors. You cannot replace a really good editor, a professional editor. 
But what I choose to do is look at the same product from three different sets of eyes, three different mindsets, and usually that turns out perfectly well for me. And that brings us to the end of this podcast. So what's happening in Psychotactics land? At the end of July, we start out the article writing course, and I've been working very hard to finish the website by the end of June, because once July rolls along, the article writing course does take up a lot of my time, a lot of my energy. And it's high tension for people who are attending that course, because they have to do an assignment like five times a week, and for three whole months. And for me as well, it's a lot of work, because that course generates between 10,000 to 15,000 posts in those three months. So it's pretty intense and everybody still has a lot of fun. And we've been talking about this in 5000 BC. It's like what gets people to the end point. And a lot of people talk about it from a perspective of completion. So you'll hear people saying, look, we have a 90% completion rate. But completion rate is not the criterion. The criterion is skill. And when people finish that course, they have to be able to write. When people finish a cartooning course, they have to be able to draw. There is no completion. Completion is like going to school and finishing school. Great. So what next? So this is a factor of skill. And that's what psychotactics courses are about. And the next course that is rolling out is the cartooning course. If there's one course that people come to me and talk about a life-changing experience, it's this course. And it's not because of the syllabus or the way we teach or whatever. It's just that cartooning is so far out in that realm. Like, you know, I could never do that. So you could say, maybe I can't cook, but possibly if I were forced to cook, I could do that. Or maybe I can't, you know chop hedges, but I could learn to do that. But cartooning just seems out of that realm. And, and what people often tell me is that it became that doorway. It became that doorway to confidence that if I could do this one thing, which is cartooning, what else could I do? Now, the cartooning course is not really well named. It's called the Da Vinci course. So go to psychotactics.com slash Da Vinci. That's D A. V-I-N-C-I. Get on the waiting list. There are only 30 seats this year, so it's going to go relatively quickly, like all psychotactics courses. Go to psychotactics.com slash da vinci and make sure that you're on the waiting list. The first 30 people to get in, they get on the course. What other live events do we have this year? There is the Houston workshop on sales pages, how to craft that whole sales page with all of those multiple things that seem to be only the domain of copywriters. Well, we're going to show you how to do this. We've already done this in New Zealand. We've done this in Brussels. We've done this in Singapore. And I can tell you that it's not going to take three days to get there. It's going to take maybe two days, two and a half days, and you're able to craft a sales page. And then whatever products you have, whatever services you have in future, you don't have to go outside. You can do it yourself and you can do it with impunity. You can do it knowing that you have that skill and that skill is transferable. And I give this out. I give a postcard. And when you look at that postcard, you can write that sales page based on that postcard. That's how permanent the lesson is. You don't even have to look at any notes. There are just two seats left at this point and the prices are going up. They've already gone up in the last week and they will keep going up. So that's at psychotactics.com slash landing pages. And it's on the 28th, 29th and 30th of October this year. And that's pretty much it from Psychotactics land. If you're really keen to get your business ahead in the sense that you have a question and someone answers that specific question instead of just throwing articles at you or another book at you, which you're not gonna read, then you can join us in 5000 BC. So if you'd love to join us in 5000 BC, go to 5000 BC, 
register, you have to pay $10, wait for 21 days, and then we get you in. So that's it from Psychotactics Land, and I'll say bye for now. Bye-bye. Still listening? One of the questions that I get from people is, should I start a podcast? Now, this is a very difficult question to answer. But one of the things that frustrates me a lot is that everyone pushes these large numbers on you. They say, you know, get a thousand people, get 10,000 people, get all of these things. And, and they'll even talk about money this way. But just sticking to the podcast, think of your podcast as an auditorium, not a stadium. Because if you were in an auditorium, and let's suppose it's a really small auditorium, and let's say there are just 10 people. Well, imagine this were an event outside and you were called to speak to 10 people. This is what we used to do. We used to drive, I don't know, an hour and a half just to get to the next town or sometimes further than the next town to speak to five people or 10 people. Sometimes there would be 20 people. There were no podcasts when we started out. And so to get that message across, we had to do all of this driving. We had to spend the whole day doing this. And today you have this capacity. Sure, you can't reach 10,000 people. You can't reach 5,000 people. You possibly can't reach 50 people. But maybe you can reach 20 people. And if you've got just enough great content that isn't going to eat up all of the time, then a podcast might be the right thing for you. Now, we're not selling podcasts for any reason. In fact, thank you, but we don't need any more competition. There's enough competition out there. And that's probably what you're thinking. But more than 50% of the people that attend our workshops and courses and buy our books, they all say we listen to the podcast. So even though we don't have huge numbers because we do no promotion, we don't go out there and do ads and we don't do cross promotions and stuff like that, there are still a huge number of clients that are listening to the podcast. Think of it as a room. Think of it as a small room and you're speaking to the people. And if you've got the time to do that podcast and you have a very small audience, well, that's still the way to go. And maybe you're very busy now. Like we put off the podcast for a long time and we started out when we had more breathing space. So we were working with Marsha for two or three years. I couldn't do anything. I could barely do any of the courses. We canceled all our courses. So we didn't have that bandwidth. And you might not have that bandwidth now, but consider it. And when you do consider it, if you want to start a podcast, make sure that it's consistent. Since we started the podcast, we're now edging in on 200 episodes and we haven't missed any week. So whatever you're going to do, that's fine. Make sure that you don't miss it. And, and this is the same for the newsletter. We started out in 2000 and when you multiply 52 by 18, that's 936 newsletters that we've sent out in text format. So just have to be consistent about this. And that's it. So I'll say bye now and thanks for listening to the podcast. And if you haven't left a review, then please do so. Bye for now and see you in 5000 BC.